Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Lit Up Lightworker podcast, bringing you fun and soulful interviews with spiritual teachers with the aim of tuning you in and lighting you up. You can access all episodes of the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and TuneIn. And be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos and interviews all about finding and following your life purpose. I'm George Lizos. I'm a spiritual teacher, intuitive healer, the author of Be the Guru, Lightworkers Gotta Work, and the number one best selling protect your light and today I have with me Jade Shaw. Jade is an out-of-body experienced out-of-body experience researcher and astral projection teacher that advocates expanded states of consciousness for personal and collective change. After a life-changing OBE, she researched the transformative effects of the phenomena for her MSc in transpersonal psychology. Keen to raise awareness of the transformative benefits of astral projection, she produced Inside Out, an OBE film on Gaia TV, featuring worldwide experts such as best-selling author Eben Alexander, award-winning researcher Dr. David Luke, and former NASA physicist Tom Campbell. She's the astral projection consultant for the Netflix series Behind Her Eyes, and she won the 2021 Kindred Spirit magazine Emerging Voice Award. Jade, welcome to the Lit Up Lightworker podcast. Thank you for having me and thank you for that wonderful introduction. So I, I'm glad to get into a juicy conversation. Yes, I am so excited to, to, to talk about astral projection. I have wanted to do an episode about it for years, but I haven't yet. I was waiting for the right person and you're certainly that person because I astral projection was actually one of the first spiritual modalities I practiced back when I was 18 years old. I joined the Gnostic movement, which back then was like an international movement where they taught astral projection. And I remember the first time I practiced it, I'm like, oh my God, what is happening? I'm, I'm outside of my body. I, I remember <laughs> we had to do some tests to figure out if we were out of the body or not, which would involve like pulling your finger. And if it, if it, elongates that means you are out of your body and I pull my finger I'm like oh my god it's growing longer so I turn and I look at my body sleeping and then I freaked out and of course that brought me back into my body now before we jump into it you're gonna tell us all about that I want to hear a little bit about your story of discovering astral projection and getting to teach it Yes. Wow. Oh my gosh. Where do I start? Firstly, I just want to say, you know, it made me smile when you were talking about the image of pulling the finger. Uh, when you come out of your body and do that, it's absolutely nuts for the first time. So I can see why you got like, whoa, this is crazy. And then back to the body. <laughs> um, so yeah, my story started when I was really young. I had spontaneous experiences. Um, I would go to bed and in the middle of the night, it would feel like the bed was shifting back and forth. I would have these vibrations through the body. I'd be able to sort of see through my eyelids and I didn't know what was happening. It was super scary. And then I had these experiences and my mum even thought about taking me to see a child psychologist because I didn't know what was happening. But then I realized if I slowed my breathing down, it would bring these experiences to a stop. So that's what I did. Fast forward to the future and I'm in my 30s at this point, I've met my husband, I run a dance company and I go into this uh, bookshop and I pick up a book off the shelf called Journeys Out of the Body by Robert Monroe. And I start reading it and I think, oh my God, this is what I was experiencing when I was a child. Maybe it wasn't all just a dream, maybe it was an out of body experience. So I thought, okay, I'm going to give it a go. I'm going to try some techniques. So for a whole month, I tried some techniques with the book. Nothing happened. So I gave up. But then one night I'd got up to the loo to go to the toilet, came back and dropped straight into the vibrational state. This is the transitory precursor state just before we separate from the body. And I knew at this point, oh my gosh, if I do an exit technique now, I could leave my physical body. So that's what I did. I decided to roll out and I stood in my room and I was thinking, oh my God, I'm out of my body. And I turned back and saw it lying there. And then I thought, okay, stay calm, stay calm, which is what you have to do, otherwise you shoot back. And I decided to go out the window. So I flew out the window, 
dropped down into the street and then looked at my arms and my body and I looked like the invisible woman my form was made of light of energy and a little bit like when you said um, George when I moved my arm it left a trail of light behind and I had extrasensory perception and awareness I could sense the dew on the tips of the grass in the park opposite and I do remember thinking, oh my God, this is so cool. But I'm still in the experience, right? What, what do I do now? So I decided to go get a door number at a few streets down the road. I've never been there before to see if I could verify the experience when I came back. So I found a house on a crossroads with a green door with the paint stripping off, it said number 18. I thought, okay. I've got the door, I'm going to verify this when I come back to my body, but oh my God, I am still here. How am I still in this experience? So then I go, I'm going to yell out a command and see what happens. So I kind of opened my arms, did a big gesture to the space, to the universe, and went, take me to Nirvana. And then all of a sudden, the experience was out of my control. Some sort of unseen force picked me up and I floated up up above the trees but before I got to the clouds I passed through what seemed to be some sort of thin membrane I describe it as kind of like a flat sheet of static hanging in the sky and when I passed through I lost all sense of an astral body my energy body I was now just a floating point of awareness and I was being gravitated to a white light at the end of a huge tunnel that filled the entirety of my perception. I got halfway down the tunnel and then I got scared. And what happens when you get scared in that body experience? Back to my physical body. So I sat up in bed looking at my arms and at the time uh, my then husband woke up and he's saying, what's happened, what's happened? I'm looking at my arms, which has static all over them thinking, I I've just had an out of body experience. He says, oh, Okay, rolls over and goes back to sleep. Typical. Uh, he's had these experiences before, so he knew that it was safe and there was nothing wrong. But that same day, I go back to the house on the crossroads to see if it was the same number I saw, and it was number 18. This absolutely blew my mind. And then I looked up the Tunnel of Light, which of course cross-culturally is mentioned in out-of-body experiences and near-death experiences. And this is why I had to leave my career as a choreographer and a dancer. I couldn't go on doing the same work, knowing what I knew now, which is why I decided to go back to university and do my master's in transpersonal psychology. But it was a really tough decision because I just got an email through from a national governing body saying they were gonna fund one of my dance projects and invest in it for three years and roll it out across the UK. And it seems like at that point, the universe was going, do you really want to make this decision? Do you really want to take this jump? Is this what you want to do now? Is this your purpose? So I thought I'm going to take that leap of faith. I'm going to do it. So I said, no, thank you, but no thanks. And the rest is history. And now I'm here speaking to you about astral projection. Yes, and we're so <laughs> glad you did because we need you teaching about this. More people need to experience astral projection. I find there, there's a lot of fear around it. Like, I remember when I told my dad and my mom that I was getting out of my body at 17 years old, they were like, they actually called a doctor. Then my, a few years later, my cousin told me she was experiencing some, something like that. They took her to the priest for like an exorcism. So there is a lot of fear of people feeling like, oh, what if I can't come back home? Like, what if I get attacked? So let's just bust a few of those myths. Is astral projection safe and why? Yes, it is safe. And I'm pretty sure I can speak on the top five teachers in the world on astral projection who would also say, yes, it is safe. And the, you mentioned two there, George, of what I call the three irrational fears. So the three irrational fears are, can I get back to my body? Will I be attacked and will I be possessed? And so the first answer to that is yes, you'll come back. And the others are no. So it, it really depends on our belief systems that we take with us into the astral planes and then how we deal with those or our stories we tell ourselves about the experiences 
that we have. This is why I take a mindfulness approach. And I'll give you an example of that. I have a good friend um, who is a teacher and he came out of his body and he saw a shadow walking towards him. And he thought, oh my gosh, what is this? This looks scary. But being a teacher, he knew not everything appears as it seems. So he allowed this figure to come forward. And as it formed in front of him, it was actually his son. So he ended up going on this absolutely amazing journey, which is called a shared out of body experience with his son. And then when he woke up in the morning, they corroborated the story. His son came to him first and was like, did you actually project last night? And he was like, yes. And he was like, so did I. And he's like, did you go here? And he was like, yeah, I did. And so they were like, oh my God, we had a shared experience. So sometimes the way we perceive things isn't as accurate as what they appear to be. And, you know, this is really reflective of modern neuroscience. We know now it's, it's very current news that the reality we see is based on our prediction and expectation of it. So you can have three different people have the same astral projection experience and yet interpret it in three different ways. Um, and one, it could be terrifying. Another, it could be like, okay. And another one, it could change their life based on how they uh, it's interpret what happens effectively. Yes. Now, speaking on that interpretation, we hear uh, people, and I've, I've experienced this myself, talking about the lower astral plane and the higher astral plane. Essentially talking about how in the, uh, in the lower astral plane, that's where you can meet like low level spirits that can attack you. Can you speak about the possibility of attack and why it happens and how to protect yourself when you are in that lower astral plane? Yeah, so there's a couple of things going on here. First, before we get into sort of the attacks as a specific thing, um, I'm going to say something that may be quite controversial here. So in order to get to the higher planes, you have to go to the lower planes. They are like two sides of the same coin, it, it, almost like quantum realities simultaneously mm -hmm. existing. So the deeper we go down, the higher we can fly. So there's this kind of connection uh, uh, interwoven between them. And what I kind of mean by that is, I come from a transpersonal psychology background. So one of the views that I take is that the places that we spontaneously end up, which may appear dark or negative, there's a reason that we're there. Think about it. All the infinite astral projection planes and dimensions we could possibly go to, why are we spontaneously having this experience at this time in our lives? So I always say there's a message or a lesson for us to learn, often a healing, a hidden healing behind that related to the environment, the dark lower plane that we're in and what we encounter there. Now, it might be um, what I what's called a thought form or, or a thought form environment. So this is when part of our suppressed psyche um, is manifested in a personified way, meaning we can kind of meet an aspect of our trauma in shamanism that it would be uh, their perspective would be uh, similar to soul retrieval. So a part of us that is split off at a time of trauma, let's say when we're a kid, we might end up going to a lower plane and meeting it and then be able to interact, embrace and heal that part, which is then released and then gives us access to higher parts of ourselves because of that release there. So that's usually what is the case. So what I call these shadow out of body experiences or soul integration experiences with the lower realms. But also you could be called to help someone or something there. So it could be you've been, you've been called there because you have the necessary gifts to help someone lift out of that dark place or move on from there. So it's not always all about us as well. We tend to think it is. It might be that we need to help someone from that place. Um, and then in regards to attacks, thinking that we're going to be attacked usually comes from the spiritualist perspective the sh or the shamanic perspective, which are usually uh, quite dualistic ways of looking at reality that there's a set that there's me here and that there's other things outside of myself and that might be the case in fact i all i'm going to go off on a philosophical tangent here but you know we tend to think oh the buddhist view is either everything's an extension of me or my or my mind or let's just say for for example the shamanism one is is everything is is um uh, separate but also interconnected usually they both say actually somehow it may be a way that's difficult to comprehend. What if it's both? What if things are separate from ourselves and also somehow 
it's part of us as well at the same time in a weird kind of quantum universe thing. So when we're being attacked, um, it's good to, I'm gonna give you two things that you can do because then you can feel into whether it, it feels, is it really attack or is it actually something that's been trying to catch my attention for something I need to heal? So the first thing you can do, if you think this is happening, um, is uh, the rain technique. So this is assuming that you've got out of body and you're in a certain place. The rain technique is Tara Brack's mindfulness technique, which I've adapted to astral projection. So we recognize where we are. Let's say I've come out of my body, come out of my body, I'm somewhere I don't know, and I'm a bit cautious. So I just recognize where I am, I'm paying attention. Second part is I accept where I am. So I accept that I'm here. If I don't accept that I'm in this dark place, I can't actually then deal with being in it. So I've got to accept, okay, I am here, I accept that I'm here. I, investigation, so you really investigate. What can I see? What can I feel? What can I sense? And then N, and this is the hardest part, everybody struggles with this, even me, is non-identification. So we don't start identifying with what's in the space. And an example of this would be, oh my God, I'm in a dark place. I must be a bad person. I must be evil. I must have lots of things to heal. Why am I here? I'm starting to make a story about the space, which we don't actually know if it's true. So all the analyzing we want to do and reflecting, we can do when we get back. But in that moment, we've got to try and not self-identify. So that's the rain technique. This calms and neutralizes the space from our own emotions. So we don't cloud a filter over the lens that we're looking through. Then we can tune in to our heart and feel into, is there something here with what I'm seeing? Let's see, say we're seeing a, a dark, be what we perceive to be a dark being. Am I tuning in to myself? And this being, do I feel like this is actually something separate or could it be something part of my own mind? And then from that intuition, decide whether you want to leave because you can just leave. People forget they're gonna get stuck. You can leave and go straight back to the body or am I actually going to engage with this? I had a, a, sleep, a sleep paralysis experience once, uh, which isn't astral projection, but you can springboard. It's a gateway into astral projection. I only teach it to advanced practitioners though, because it can be a very scary space. Um, so I had a, an astral projection experience once and for lack of a better word, a demon, I just say a demon for anything perceived to be a negative presence, um, was on my back and it looked like it was burned. It had a horrific face. Its face was here, it was breathing on me and uh, it was terrifying. But I've had these since I was a kid. My natural reaction is just to fight them. Um, but I try and do this engaging thing now. So I came out of my body, I did an exit technique. I was in, I was in mum roll, I was like, I'm not up for this today, right? Mum roll, I'm coming out. What are you doing here? What do you want? So I come out of my body, I turn to it and in order to sort of claim power over it or find out the truth I said to it what's your name so I go what's your name and it turned to me and it went my name's Jade so in that instance I tuned into that is is its name really Jade or, or is it just saying that to present itself a certain way to me and I genuinely felt no it, it, it is actually as soon as he said my name is Jade there was this inner release I felt light I felt I felt a complete shift in my consciousness, but it was so overwhelming for me to stay there and, and ask more questions that I just came back to my body. But I feel like whatever that, that power was holding, was hiding, some of it was released just through witnessing and observing that that was a shadow aspect of myself um, in, that, in sleep paralysis. So that's an example of shadow out of body experiences. Yes, and I, what I loved about what you just shared is that you were assertive with it. You, you owned it. You were not afraid of it because fear is the one that feeds mm -hmm. all these low level spirits, which as you said, is just um, a, a way of perceiving reality. We have the ego and then we have our higher self and we can perceive life through our ego, which sees duality, or we can perceive life through our higher self, which knows that we're all one. So you just essentially made that shift from ego to higher self and realize, you know what? you disempower it instantly. I love that. And I think it brings a lot of calm and a lot of safety to people who want to try astral projection but are afraid of what they're going to face because now they can realize that, you know what, it's all manageable. There are ways to shift things around and it's all safe and it's something that you can use for growth and healing and transformation. Now, I now that we know that this is safe, I want to go a step back to define astral projection and say, what is astral projection 
and why does it happen i mean is it something that happens naturally or is it something that we have to try to experience okay yes brilliant question i'm going to answer the first one first what it is and then the second one um why it happens um so how we define astral projection depends on the lens that we're looking through so uh, psychology would say that you are traveling within a world of your imagination or your or your own memory mm. i don't personally believe that because you can verify experiences how is that possible um, neuroscience would say that um, your the tpj the tempo parietal junction in the brain is being triggered and your self-awareness is not quite sure where it is um, that's not quite accurate because no one's really had an out-of-body experience in neuroscience. They've just felt a bit floaty when they've had the brain scan around. They haven't had a full separation, so to speak. Um, but I look at it like I kind of to adopt the transpersonal psychology view. So transpersonal psychology is the study of spirituality, consciousness and psychology and how they correlate. So this is when our self-awareness, where we perceive ourselves to be in time and space, mine is here in my body in this chair, um, it seems to somehow expand beyond the body. So I don't sort of think that something is completely leaving and going because if, a, if our consciousness was fully leaving, what, what is keeping the heart going? What is making our eyes move? What is making our breath flow? There's still some energy centers in the body that remain. And this is what the Mexican Toltec uh, tradition, shamanic tradition uh, believes as well, that it's uh, one of the energy centers that moves out. Uh, and I interpret that uh, as our self-awareness shifting beyond. Now, spiritualists will say that the spirit is leaving the body and uh, soul is leaving the body and shamans will say the spirit is leaving the body. Again, depending on how you wanna interpret those. But those are sort of a few different definitions there. If you're thinking, well, how do I know if I've had one? you will have the sense of separation from the body, floating out, sinking back, turning over. There'll be this sense of separation. That feels really real. You know, there's a reason why, you know, there's this feeling of, well, my soul or my spirit came out. It certainly feels like it. And then you will have the energy or the astral body, sometimes perceived yes. as light or energy. And then you will have the experience of traveling in this world, the physical realm or other dimensions uh, around you. So those are the kind of the three definitions if you've had one. I always say uh, it's like a near-death experience without the death part, where people find themselves floating out, seeing what's going on around them, and then they can come back to their physical body. Yes, so the, way, the way that I've experienced it and that I understand it is thinking of the different layers of the aura, the different bodies of the aura essentially of our being, the fourth layer is the astral layer. So essentially that part of our aura, that part of our energy field, that astral body essentially mm -hmm. exits the body and then all the other layers are still there maintaining our well-being, etc. Is that yes. what it is essentially? Yeah, that's the yogic view, exactly. So that's what they say within that tradition that is leaving as well. So it's um, so then why does it happen? Why does yeah. the experience happen? So you don't have to be a monk. You don't have to be a shaman, a medicine woman, a warrior, a king or a queen, which were the only people that would get taught this way, way, way back in the day, the ancient Egyptian, ancient Greeks, the Tibetan Buddhists and the shamans. Everyone can do it. It's a human experience, hmm. happens spontaneously. Um, so it is something that everyone can do. The reason why it happens can be several different things. The first is it can just happen if you hit what I call the sweet spot. So there's nothing magical or mystical about this. It just depends if you happen to fall into this altered state of awareness without realizing. And it actually happens to many people. So on the cusp of sleep, you might be falling asleep, you lose sensation of your body, we call this total body dissolution, but your mind is awake and aware. And then for some reason you go to turn over, but your physical body doesn't, your astral body turns over and you come out of your body. This happened to my friend, Dr. David Luke at Greenwich University. He studied psychedelics and their impact. He turned over in the middle of the night, got up to go to the toilet and his hand went straight through the toilet door and he'd oh. had an out of body experience. So it, it can just happen spontaneously. Um, on the cusp of sleep, but also in a, in a massage. It can happen um, uh, in pregnancy when pregnant women are going into labor. So if you go into any altered state, like heightened anxiety, deep relaxation, deep levels of meditation, you can springboard from that. It's a bit like getting into a car. The car can go anywhere. Let's say the car is an altered state. Car can go anywhere. Um, if you choose to do an, an out-of-body experience technique, an exit technique, at the right time, 
you will springboard into an out-of-body experience. So you can springboard from a shamanic journey, from a lucid dream, from your sleep states, from deep meditation, or some people have it in high anxiety as well. So there's three different types. So I've, I've just explained the spontaneous one. The second one is what we call forced, which is through um, anxiety or a near-death experience. Basically, the body or the mind is compromised through fear or injury. And our sense of self goes, I don't want to stick around. This is shit. I'm leaving. And you come out. But then usually you get sucked back in very quick. These ones are very rare and quick. And then the third one, and not many people know about this, but some of your viewers might have had one. This is what I found out from my research from my master's degree is the evolutionary out-of-body experience. If you've been at a crossroads in your life, something's happened or you want to make a big decision or you're, or you're not too sure, your psyche, psyche being the Greek word for soul, your psyche might have a spontaneous out-of-body experience to a specific place or plane where you retrieve some sort of message, insight, wisdom that you bring back to the body and then you make a, a great change, whether it's moving house, um, leaving a relationship or starting a new one, uh, a sudden epiphany about what career you want to have, a healing of grief, maybe you um, lost your child and then you, you meet them in an OBE and that heals you. So it seems like the psyche for some people can call on an out of body experience as a way to actualize into being a new sense of self and a new reality that needs to happen for that person um, at that time. And I can be different for everyone. One of my case studies, um, Kaz, she had, she met her dead father in her out-of-body experience. It allowed her to get closure. Another one, Syrah, had a spiritual awakening. She had what we call a numinous out-of-body experience, interconnection with the divine oneness. Absolutely changed her life. She changed career after that. And another guy, um, Paul, he lost loads of fear. So he left school, he led a rock and roll lifestyle and he was really afraid of education because at school he was told he wouldn't amount to anything. And then he had an out-of-body experience and he said all his fear left him. He said he had this epiphany that he could do anything that he wants with his life. So even though he'd left school, at, uh, didn't even do his GCSEs, he is now uh, just finishing his master's degree in philosophy. After that experience, he decided to go back to education because of the fear that was lost from, from that. So I've kind of gone off on a tangent there. No, I thank you for sharing the different uh, types of astral projection. I especially did not know about the last one. I would think of it as something in between a retrieving past life skills if you go to a past life or I guess you know the walk-in experiences where sometimes the soul lives and another soul steps into the body but it's not that but it's sort of like that right because a part of the psyche goes learn something goes on a spiritual retreat essentially and then comes back bringing something new how exciting now I have a question about the the process because there are different processes as you've just mentioned the way that I learned to do it was learn to concentrate on something specific for me it was the beating of the heart so that while you go asleep the body goes asleep but the mind stays awake so once you go into the sleep paralysis the vibration starts that's your moment okay time to get out now this is the mindful technique that i learned how to do it but i know there are different techniques can you just share the stages uh, that are present within all of these techniques like what happens first what happens next second and what happens next yeah, exactly. So regardless of what lineage or tradition uh, you're coming from to learn astral projection, they will all want to take you through these three steps. And this is the mind awake body asleep state, which is where the mind is awake and aware, but the body is completely asleep, which is what you said, you know, focusing on the heart. That's a great one, the heartbeat. And then the second stage is the vibrational state. So they're wanting to trigger this sense of vibrations. Now this can be quite intense. Just some people freak out the first time it happens. Um, and it can be feeling that you're in a huge vacuum, energy moving, it's been described as electricity. You could have flashes of light, uh, bolts going through your body, but it can also be very subtle, uh, more like a hum 
Graham Nichols, who wrote the book Navigating the Out of Body Experience, says he believes that the more experiences you have, the less uh, intense the vibrational state can be. Uh, but it is completely safe. If you're sitting there thinking, oh my God, this sounds terrifying, it is safe. And actually, when you get the vibrations after you've had many, you're like, yes, here we go. It's time to fly. Um, so you go into the vibrational state. Then you want to do an exit technique. Sometimes, so this is stage three, exiting the body. Sometimes the vibrations you'll springboard naturally. And actually I say, rather than trying to force an exit technique, intuitively feel into the vibrations and where they might be taking you. Some people exit out the head, out, out the bottom, uh, not their bottom, but out their feet. <laughs> Although you could do. Um, so then you would have an exit technique. So then you would do something that would take you, your awareness and shift out of the body. An easy one is the rollout technique, which I described briefly in my experience. So you go to roll over as though you're actually rolling. So you don't imagine in your mind, you don't pretend, you actually go to roll but you don't move your physical body, which might sound a bit weird, but you actually do end up rolling out. So you would do an exit technique, mind awake, body asleep, trigger the vibrational state, and then exit technique. And you can do this through breathing techniques, visualizations, self-hypnosis, um, meditative, different meditative concentration practices. Um, or some people have it naturally. Some people don't even try. And I'm thinking, oh my God, this is amazing. You don't even try and you have these experiences. There's a funny story, William Buhlman from the, the, the Monroe Institute, which is the biggest company in the world for the study of expanded states of consciousness, particularly astral projection. He said, he had a man come up to him and said, look, I want a simple life. I don't want these experiences happening to me. He says, I come out of my bed every other day. I sit on the end of the bed and I just want to get back in my body. I don't want this happening to me. How, what can I do to stop it? And William Buhlman was like, are you mad? You have the universe at your fingertips. Go and explore the multiverse. He was like, no, I just want, to, just want a good night's sleep. <laughs> so it can happen regardless, you know, of training all of these techniques. And some teachers prefer to just have one technique, otherwise it can get a bit too overwhelming for the student, I think. Yes, I feel the same way when I meet people who are like, oh, it happens to me all the time. And there I am practicing for a month straight every single night to be able to have one <laughs> astral projection experience. Now, my problem when I was doing it was staying out long enough because I found myself stepping out. That was okay, fun for a while. And then I would eventually like step into a dream. And then in the morning, I would doubt myself, did I astral project or was it a dream? So how do we stay in the astral projected state longer? Yeah, that's, I'm really glad you brought that up, George. For one, one reason for that is for those people that feel that they won't come back to their physical body or they'll get lost. This is exactly what I say. Actually, you'll struggle to stay out of body because most experiences are so short. This is why I was shocked when I had the big one that changed my life because it was actually really long, but normally they're quite short lived. So I'm glad that you've mentioned that. And I've just forgot what the question was again. Remind me the second part. Yes, yes. The question was, how do we stay out longer? Yes. So this is to do with cultivating a habit of concentration and presence, which is why there's practices that I give to my students in my workshops to practice throughout the week whilst they're at work, because it's been able to focus and concentrate. There are lots of different ones, but one that I'll teach you is um, called anchoring awareness. So I, this is so you're out of body, you're in some sort of astral plane, you can kind of feel it's, it's about to shift, you, you're losing it, and it, and it almost feels like you're a bit tired or you start to lose focus. So you want to be like a cowboy lassoing the horse with your mind. So let's say I'm in a park in the out-of-body experience. I anchor my awareness to something in the picture, the bench, the tree, uh, something I can see, a flower. So I anchor my mind to it and I become present. I try not to think what I'm doing, where I'm going. I just be with what I'm seeing and I witness that and then I move towards it. So I'm anchoring my awareness. I've lassoed the bench and then I'm pulling myself towards it through anchoring my awareness. And I keep my perception open because obviously I can see what's happening in the rest of the scene, but I'm focused on one thing. So this is, it's like grounding in that plane. So, um, so then it doesn't kind of fall away. So that's one technique. Yes. That. 
I love it and it's so much better than what I was taught. I was told just hold on to something in the astral plane. <laughs> so I found myself like holding on to my bookcase. I'm like, no! <laughs> I love that though. I mean, you can do that. I mean, sometimes, yeah. sometimes you can grip onto things, but sometimes your arms just go through it as well. Exactly. So this, this is why it's good to use your, you know, your anchor in your awareness. Because remember, your your so one of the things I say if you're struggling having longer experiences, it's to do with the strength and level of your awareness as well. So you need to strengthen your awareness to strengthen the connection to the plane because they're, they're both connected. So that's why it's good to use your mind rather than just to, yes. to hold, hold on for dear life. Because you're energetically then tied to the place rather than just kind of physically because it's somewhere, something in between. Now, my final question is, are dreams unconscious astral projection experiences? Okay, so I have a strong opinion about this, but it may be controversial. Um, I well, actually, I, I I have to say this. When I interviewed Charlie Morley, your ex-husband, I asked him the same question, and he said, "Ask Jade." So here I am, a few years later, asking you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, again, it depends on what 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 lens you're looking through. So am I looking it through the spiritualist lens, the shamanic lens, the Tibetan Buddhist lens, the neuroscience lens? But generally, from my experience, I was a lucid dreamer before I had my big OBE. I documented over 300 lucid dreams, uh, and it was definitely a different experience in a, a different space. So I would say that a dream, and this is a very simplified version, a dream, you are in the 360 degree hyper virtual reality of your own mind. I describe it as being in the laptop of your own consciousness. You have access to the files, the, the memories and the pictures from your own life. Astral projection is like going into the internet. So you end up going beyond the boundary of your own psyche into let's say collective consciousness, wider realms and spaces of being. Now, but this is where it gets a bit tricky. You can springboard from the dream and then fall back in, as you said. So I kind of say there's like a cable that's attached to the laptop, to the internet, from your own mind, your own dream into the, the wider realms. So you can shift beyond it. I actually teach a workshop of how to shift from the lucid dream, a dream in which we know we're dreaming, hmm. into astral projection. But then it's recognizing the difference and having enough experiences. Because of course, if there's, a, let's say there is a cable, can your dead grandma come into a dream and visit you? This is what we call visitation dreams. And I make sense of that. They're entering my own psyche and having an engagement rather than me going into the afterlife, let's say, the bardo state, the imaginal realms, the Sufis call it. I'm going there versus them coming here. So that's where I make sense of it. But even that is questionable because where is the boundary of our own mind versus the, the doorway to extra realms? Where is that line that we draw? So that's, that's the bigger question. I love it. And I love that there is a connection essentially, but we don't know the extent of that connection and how it works essentially, but we know it happens. So it's, it's room for exploration. Thank you so much for, for sharing these with us. And thank you so much for sharing all of these fabulous tools about astral projection. It makes me so much more excited to get back into it. Now, can you please let everybody know where they can get in touch with you and how they can learn from you and with you? Yes. So you can go to my website, www.jadeshaw.com, or I actually update my Instagram more, which is jade underscore shaw underscore astral underscore teacher. And I have online courses and day courses, but actually I'm just about in two weeks time, we're going to launch this amazing academy. I haven't told anyone. Actually, I told George just before this call, which is called the Astral Academy. And I've got seven amazing world experts in astral projection to give uh, master classes each week for seven weeks. So if you're interested in that, drop me an email, info at jadeshaw.com, and I can send you some information before it goes out live in two weeks. And all the details of that will be in the show notes below so that, so that everybody okay. can enjoy that. Jade, thank you so much for joining us. I loved having you on the podcast and I'm so excited for everybody to experience astral projection. Wishing you a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you for having me. See you.